Hey guys, it's Allie. Welcome back to Infertile AF, the podcast. This is episode 96 called L'Oreal. Okay, so let me tell you guys about today's guest, L'Oreal. She is a Chicago girl like myself. She is a journalist like myself. She's written about her infertility journey a lot in Self Magazine and Hello Giggles. And one thing I really liked about this story is that, as L'Oreal says herself, she is in the messy middle right now. So she doesn't know how her story is going to turn out, but she wants to share it anyway. And I know when I asked you guys on Instagram what you wanted to see in upcoming podcasts, a lot of people said they wanted to hear people's journeys that were still happening. You know, they didn't always want to hear a happy ending or, you know, somebody ending up a certain way. So this is one of those stories where L'Oreal is still in the midst of it, and she's going to talk about everything she's been through so far, including jealousy when friends announce pregnancies how this has affected her marriage and the shame that black women feel and their hesitation to speak about infertility. She also talks about how the face of infertility is usually a thin white woman. So we're going to get into all of that and how IVF can be a full-time job. So she is amazing. I'm so happy to share this story with you guys today. Uh, without further ado, this is L'Oreal's infertility story. Hi there. Thank you so much for doing this today. It's so great to meet you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I of appreciate course, it. Of course. So I know that you wrote a really great article for Self Magazine, and I wanted to kind of start there. The headline of that article was infertility rates are higher among black women. So why do we feel so alone? And the subhead was infertility can be an isolating experience. So I'd love to hear why you wrote that and you know go through your whole fertility journey, which you said started in about September, 2018. Yeah. And it's, I think even going before that, because I am such a planner, uh, such a storyteller. So my background's in journalism and I'm also a freelance writer and blogger. And I've documented essentially the journey from the very beginning, even when that was deciding I'm not ready for kids right now. So there was another article that I had written for Mater Mia. Um, it's a website for Black moms, aspiring moms, everyone in that kind of how you define motherhood. And I wrote about putting my career before our family because what I recognized very early on, even though I had a, a plan and like all caps kind of, cause everyone has a plan. Right. Um, it was like, we got married at 27. Uh, we would start our family when I turned 30. And as I got closer and closer to 30, I was just kind of freaking out because I realized that, you know, it's going to look a lot different for me and my husband. Like I wanted to get to a certain place in my career. I wanted to be settled. I wanted to be director. I wanted to be making more money realistically because kids are expensive and we mm -hmm. live in Chicago. There's like a lot of logistics side of that. And I kind of wrote about why I wanted to put that plan on pause. And that was around 2016 or 2017, I think. And then I, I wrote another piece after it was like, well, we do want to have kids, but I'm afraid of everything that can go wrong. And that was mm -hmm. a piece for Hello Giggles um, that I wrote in that. And when it all finally came to a head, like, okay, going to start trying. That was the beginning of January, 2019. So we had watched, mm -hmm. and it's very appropriate that this is us is back on because that is, <laughs> that was the catalyst for the conversation that we had in the fall of 2018 with the characters, Toby and, um, gosh, why am I blanking on the sister's name right now? Kate. Kate. Yeah. Um, we we're trying to get pregnant. And I remember vividly after that episode, I turned in and was like, so are we doing this? Like, mm-hmm do we want to do this? <laughs> um, not knowing then like what lied ahead and about midway through 2019. Cause we like in September, 2018, I mm -hmm. went off birth control. I think it might've been October or December, but like I downloaded the apps. I started taking the prenatal vitamin. I did all the things that quote unquote, you're supposed to do. Right. And I thought I'd hit the ground running in January. I knew it would take a while because I read enough, like I'm smart. I know that it doesn't happen overnight for a lot of people, but January went by. 
yeah. and February went by <laughs> and yeah. these months started going by and I wrote another Hello Giggles piece about kind of the things that we don't talk about openly, like the jealousy you feel when you have friends who are announcing their yes. pregnancies and you're still waiting. Yes. Um, oh my God. It's the worst. Yes. It's yeah. And we don't talk because it's not accepted. It's not socially acceptable to be like, I'm happy for you. And I'm also jealous that this hasn't happened for me. Like mm-hmm. no one, that's not a cute little Instagram post that mm-hmm. you can put out there because people will judge. And um, I wanted to talk openly about that, about the two week wait and how it sucks when you get your period. Just, yeah, all these stories that I hadn't seen. And that was before we got our diagnosis, if you will. So I didn't even know that like, there's a reason it's not happening yet. So hold on, before we get into the diagnosis, I want to first of all say, I love that this is us was like the impetus behind (laughs) It's a and, good show. Yeah, it is a good show. But you had also been, you had fibroids, right? Before you guys even started yes. trying. Okay. Yeah. So tell me about that. Oh my gosh. It's the worst. And if a family history of it, so it wasn't surprising, but it was frustrating that doctors weren't diagnosing it or taking it seriously. So shortly after we got married in 2014, I think 2015 is when I noticed my periods were starting to get super heavy. Like we were watching the Grammys and I, this may be TMI, but like it is what it is. There's no Um, TMI in the show. Okay, cool. Um, I had like the ultra tampon with the overnight pads and still bled through all of that through my sweatpants onto the sofa cushion. Oh God. Um, Yeah. Missed a friend's wedding reception because I was in the bathroom all night, had to turn Um, down a camping trip because I was like, I can't go. <laughs> like, yeah. I have to be close to a bathroom like at all times. And it was right. really disrupting my life. And I knew something was wrong, but they were like, well, we'll change the birth control. And we went through so many different types, got the IUD, thought that, that would help. Mm-hmm. It didn't. Spoiler, it eventually like worked itself out. Like it just kind of jumped ship. Like my IUD was like, we're done here. And Whoa. left, I think <laughs> because of the clots, like it got caught up in all of that oh, and they yeah. went to look for it and it wasn't there anymore. And I was like, well, that's reassuring. Right. Did they ever find it or did, had it fallen out? No, it, like, it's, it was gone. <laughs> like, oh my God. It, it was, I never had an IUD there. Yeah. yeah. I was getting really tired, like of just, there was a doctor who even after we did a lot of the tests and they could see like, okay, the problem is fibroids. She's like, well, it's not that bad. Like you should just keep them. And I was like, what? (laughs) No, (laughs) no, we're not going to do that. And I, um, which is, was the first kind of instance. And I've seen it now throughout our fertility journey as well, especially being a black woman, having to essentially like defend myself and advocate for myself even more so because there are doctors who just don't like straight up, don't believe you and your pain, yeah. what you're going through. And that adds frustration on top of what is already a very troublesome, worrisome diagnosis. And so absolutely, I, I would love to like go deeper into that, yeah. but if you want to keep telling your yeah, story, no, like, no, we then, can, yeah, I mean, let's unpack that a little bit. Tell me about the experience that you had, you saying people, doctors don't believe you. Like, what is that? What is that all about? I don't know. I don't know if it's rooted in the kind of stereotype of a strong black woman, like they're fine. They can do that. You're, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm a doctor. I'm smarter than you. And maybe all of the above, what was especially disappointing, the doctor who had told me that it was fine and to just leave them there was another woman of color. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, wait a minute, like, aren't you supposed to be on my side? Like, aren't right. you supposed to empathize and understand? And that's why it was important for me, even at the onset, to find a doctor who was a woman of color to hopefully, like, kind of get it, you know, in mm-hmm. a way that someone else may not be able to. And that's when I found the doctors who eventually were like, yeah, we're going to get rid of these. They were like, no, this is a problem and we're going to get to the bottom of it. And they were very, very diligent about, okay, these are the options and this is what we recommend. Because the other thing is that when it, because Black women have a history of fibroids. Mm -hmm. Like there's doctors who are so quick to recommend a hysterosity or a hysterectomy. And I'm like, well, wait, I want to have kids. Like, yeah. And I know that that was true from like way back in the day. And I did not know, um, I think, and we saw this year as well with some of the, I forget the exact word for them, but I know that there were camps, like there was a black 
nurse who came out and talked about like, yeah, they're doing these to women who are at the border and different, like just, just wrong, wrong, wrong all around. Um, Giving hysterectomies, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Not something that's just like, oh, then in textbooks and this happened once upon a time, like it's still, it's still happening. happening. Yeah. Which is really upsetting on many, many levels. So I was very vocal, like, yeah, no, I want to keep everything intact. You can remove the fibroids. And that's when they recommended me to the doctor who ended up doing the myomectomy, but he found that there were about 20 fibroids Mm -hmm. when we did the surgery. I had essentially the uterus of a three, four month pregnant woman without being pregnant. Were you in pain at all? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like cramps were miserable. I think at the height of it at one time I bled for 21, 28 days straight. Oh my God. Yeah. And so it just interrupts everything, like your everyday going about life and like mm-hmm. bleeding everywhere mm-hmm. uh, all the time. It seems Plus like it's, got, it's and, kind of scary, right? When that much blood yeah. is coming out of your body, you're like, this is oh not my gosh. right. Yes, <laughs> right. this is not right. It's not normal. Mm-hmm. And we finally, yeah, I remember November 2017, it was, I got the myomectomy they removed all of them. And right after that, and it was like a six, eight week recovery. Like wow. you don't realize how much you use your core muscles until mm. you can't. <laughs> right. Cause they essentially removed them via C-section. So I have a, a whole C-section scar. It's like, okay, cool. Like, That's major surgery. Work. Right. Yeah. yeah. It really, really was. And after the recovery and everything, the doctor was like, okay, well, if you want to have kids, like you should get on that because this is like your best timing because the fibroids aren't there. You essentially have a clean slate. Right. But I looked at him and I was like, um, no, because at the time still working on a very meager nonprofit salary, we were in a one bedroom apartment. Again, it goes back to my plan. Like this wasn't part of the plan. Like he was right. essentially trying to accelerate it. And I was like, well, pump the brakes. We're not there yet. And so we didn't, we mm-hmm. were like, no, we're, we're going to stick to the plan. Mm-hmm. Did you feel better uh, though after the surgery? Like oh eventually? my gosh. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. A million times over, like was definitely painful and the recovery was slow. But afterward it was like, oh my gosh, this is what it feels like to have a, a, normal in quotes, because I know there's no such thing, but like a normal Mm -hmm. period that's like Mm -hmm. five days instead of 25. Right. So that was, that was such a relief. And then we fast forward to last summer when Mm -hmm. I realized like, okay, I know that technically you're supposed to wait a year before you see a fertility specialist, but like, you know, your body. And I knew Mm -hmm. something wasn't right. And Mm -hmm. That's when I went back to the the surgeon who had done the um, the fibroid surgery. Essentially, he was saying, okay, if you don't get pregnant this next month, we're going to run some tests. So you'll, talking to me, you do the, um, and I know it's such a, it's a big word, and I really should learn how to pronounce this, but I know it's the HSG test. Yes. They, they did the test for my husband as well. His came back, was totally fine. So we did my test and just frankly speaking, was the most painful procedure. I mean, yes, I had the surgery to remove the fibroids, but at least I got drugs for that. Like Mm -hmm. (laughs) they knock you out. I didn't feel it. This you're awake for, and you Mm -hmm. can feel every single thing. So it was like a, um, MRI kind of machine. Cause Um, there's like a tube and there's dye. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot comfortable, not comfortable. And I think, I think if you, everything is operating as it should be not that bad, but because Mm -hmm. What they found is that the tubes were blocked. So essentially going through this test, they're putting the dye in their uterus. And the um, technician had asked me, is like, okay, can you like rock back and forth? They're trying to, the goal is to get the dye into the fallopian tube so mm-hmm. they can see like, okay, there's a clear passage. That was not the case for me. Mm-hmm. I'm rocking back and forth. I'm crying real tears Aww. in <laughs> this MRI type looking thing. And afterward, you know, you can just read someone's face and know that it's not good news. And oh, like, yeah, <laughs> the doctor is going to get back to you. They're going to look at the x-ray and everything. And, and they'll call you tomorrow. And I forget the question he asked. Oh, he said that there wasn't any spillage. And I was like, OK, well, is that good or bad? It's not good, but your doctor will call with more information. And so oh, I was geez. like. 
I knew like something's not right. And very next day when the doctor called me during lunch, like I'm at the counter, I was working from home that this is pre COVID, but that day I happened to be working from home Mm -hmm. at the kitchen counter. And it, in reality, I think it was total like a two minute call, but it felt like an eternity because Mm -hmm. the very first thing is like, well, your tubes are blocked or damaged and IVF is going to be your best bet to get pregnant. And so here's some doctors to call and good luck, basically. Yeah. And I'm like, like, what? (laughs) Just smack it in the face, right? Like time out. You have just delivered a bombshell of a news, like just drop this on me. And I'm like, well, are there options? Can we unblock them? Like I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And all I'm hearing and seeing the minute someone says IVF or dollar signs, like yeah, that's eighteen twenty thousand dollars we did not budget for. It wasn't part of the plan, right? Um, not part of the plan. No, so I was devastated. Like that was really, really hard news to hear and to have it be so casual. It's like I get it. You're a doctor, and you probably make this call like right. all the time. Yeah. How me, old were you at the time? <laughs> This was last year, 30, oh gosh, why can't I remember how old I was last year? I just turned 33. Okay, 32. 32, (laughs) 31 in the summer and my birthday is in October. So that's what I was trying to. That's young though. And had you known anybody personally that had had done IVF or gone through something similar? Okay. No. Yeah. It was all this kind of uncharted territory. A friend, I was in a leadership group at the time, knew a woman, the woman who started Fertility for Colored Girls. And even when we were trying naturally and it wasn't happening, she was like, oh, well, maybe you should go to this retreat. And they had an annual fundraiser that was a high T. So, but even then I was the youngest one there. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a common misconception is that, oh, like infertility happens when you're older. Well, for even going before that, it's like, it's, that's, that doesn't happen to black women. Like that's not us. <laughs> right. Um, why do you think that is? Like why Many, many, many reasons. I think there's the, uh, so we have like the strong black woman stereotype. There's mm-hmm. also the myth that we're like hyper fertile. Mm-hmm. There's also, I think some cultural and religious sort of thing there too. I remember telling our families essentially like, Hey, this is the diagnosis. This is the route that we're probably going to take with IVF and there's um similar to therapy even of like well we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um and I'm like but but why not? And I I am Christian like I I believe in God and I was like well God made the doctors like and so there should be no problem with that or no mm-hmm. issue but it's or there's the thing you get a lot of times too especially a lot in well meaning like everyone means well. Right, um, right, right. But they're like just pray on it or, oh, it's part of God's plan. And it's like, that is not what you want to hear when you are going through it. You know, it's not helpful. Uh, So anyone who's listening and just, just know that because it kind of diminishes your experience. And I think because of a lot of that shame that, oh, you should be able to get pregnant, like black women don't have that problem there, then is a hesitation to speak up because I know in the devotionals that I was reading, other support groups I saw online, the like face of infertility is usually like a thin white woman. Right. And yes. And you had written somewhere else and something I read, maybe it was the same article, but that you were in the waiting room when you did start eventually going to the clinics and on the walls, it was just white people, right? And like Mm -hmm. white babies and you weren't feeling represented. Tell me about that. Exactly. It takes what's already like Infertility itself is an isolating experience because something somewhere is not working the way that it's supposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, when you have, you're surrounded by people. I work for a nonprofit. There's a lot of women there. Literally last year, I think there were about 12 women who were pregnant at one time wow. across our organization. And it's like, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Every time you open up Instagram or Facebook, someone's announcing and pregnancy. And so you're like, okay, everyone else is getting the thing and doing the thing and they're mm-hmm. working how it's supposed to. And for some reason, mine isn't, that is isolating in and of itself. Right. And then when you try to seek out resources or support or find someone you can connect to or relate to who looks like you, and you don't see that it intensifies 
that loneliness and that isolation. And I remember sitting in the consultation or the waiting room, rather, for a consultation to start IVF. And I'm looking around, there's not another Black couple. The bulletin board, it's all white babies, essentially, because that's the other thing. Like, there is a cost to this. Like, there is a privilege. And I'm very yeah. fortunate that insurance is good. We live in Illinois. It's one of those states where, like, the fertility coverage is mandated. And so mm-hmm. it ended up not being, we didn't have to pay as much out of pocket as I thought, but like right. that also can deter people when you don't see anyone who looks like you. Yeah. Um, and you're like, well, I can't afford this uh, because you have the conception that it's going to take thousands of thousands of dollars and don't even try or the shame as well about not being able to get pregnant on your own and not seeking treatment. Discrepancies in medical treatment, depending on what you like, like it's just very, and I, spoiler, we end up leaving the clinic that we started at. And right. interesting enough, it's funny because I was at the wing, I think it was earlier this year, but like 2020 has been five years in one. So yeah, I'm like, I think it was February, mm-hmm. uh, right before everything shut down and was talking to a friend and this woman had overheard me and was like, did you say something about IVF or infertility? They'd be like, I'm not I, uh, eavesdropping, but I just, <laughs> right. uh, I work at a clinic and wanted to um, give you some information. And I wasn't sure. I was like, I don't know. We've already done like the blood work and the testing and all the stuff to get started at this other one. But I just didn't feel welcome there. It was very much mm-hmm. like a cattle call kind of situation yeah. where it was just like in and out and very clinical, which yes, it is a clinic, but it doesn't have to feel that way. Right. <laughs> and I checked it out. I asked my husband, I was like, hey, yeah, I know we already started it with this one, but I have a good feeling about this other place. Yeah. And was this Vios? Yes. And I can cut this oh, out if you don't gosh. want to include them. But no, th- yeah, we, I we, love Vios. <laughs> we work with Vios a lot at Fertility Rally, which is my other company, and we love them yeah. too. Um, Dr. Jelani. I saw doctor. a picture of you and Ruhi. Yeah, I was like, I love her. Mm-hmm. Um, she okay. is phenomenal. Just like breath of fresh air. And what I liked especially, because like I mentioned, the other clinic, it felt very cold, very mm-hmm. um, sterile, very clinical. And there was a warmth of it. First of all, even walking in, I was like, oh my gosh, there are women of color here. <laughs> like, Plus all their um, doctors are women. All their REIs yes. are women. Yeah. yeah and like, you know awesome. the process. And with Dr. Jelani, especially having gone through it firsthand herself, I feel like she empathized yeah. with us on a level that I had not seen previously in our consultation with her. Like to give it an example, the first doctor at the other clinic, it was about 15 minutes max. Yeah. We were in her office for an hour after we were running late because Chicago traffic is a beast <laughs> after work, I was flustered and they had snacks in the waiting room. And I know that sounds really trivial, but it was that attention to detail meant a lot to me because yeah. it was like, you get it. You understand that we are busy people with busy lives. Yes. And that gesture just like meant a lot to me. And she gave us her cell phone number. Wow. She was like if you need to reach me, text me, FaceTime, whatever, here She's it is, best. like in the first meeting, right? I was like, I didn't know it could be like this. And yeah. so it takes that, again, the isolating experience. There are people who look like us, yeah. is this right? And just made us feel so welcome and cared for that I was like, yeah, this sucks. I, if I had to choose, I would not have chosen this, but mm-hmm. these are the cards we've been dealt and I we're in good hands. And that alone makes me feel so much more relieved and just like, I can breathe a little easier yes. now, you know, like knowing someone has my well, back. Well, you feel like somebody's going to partner with you rather than yeah. be, you know, you're a number in some random exactly. waiting room where they don't even really know your name. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah, good. Exactly it. Hold that thought guys. This episode is being sponsored in part by Thrive Cosmetics, an independent woman founded and owned beauty brand that specializes in high performance makeup and skincare that's both vegan and cruelty-free. Now, we all know the holidays provide the perfect excuse to get a little more glammed up than usual. And Thrive Cosmetics is a new beauty brand I've discovered and really fallen in love with. And right now, they have some amazing discounted sets that are perfect for gifting. Plus, for every product you buy, they donate to help a woman thrive. Now talk about holiday cheer. Also, you guys know I love me a female-founded and owned company, and Thrive takes it one step further. Their mission is called Bigger Than Beauty, which means that for every purchase, they donate much-needed products and funds to nonprofit partners nationwide 
who are helping women face significant challenges to thrive again. All right, now let's talk about some of their high performance products. Thrive Cosmetics products are made with skin loving ingredients and they're formulated without parabens, sulfates, and phthalates. And a lot of the sets right now include a free tube of Thrive Cosmetics best-selling Liquid Lash Extensions Mascara, which is one of my faves. This is the mascara you may have heard about that is sold every five seconds. It's flake-free, smudge-free, and clump-free, and it's got more than 7,000 five-star reviews, and it also won Glamour's Best Clean Beauty Product of 2020 Award for the Best Mascara. I was wearing it the other day and my daughter ever said, mom, are you wearing fake lashes? And I wasn't, I was just wearing their lash extensions mascara. So here's the thing. You can start thriving and help women in need today by going to thrivecosmetics.com slash infertile AF for 15% off your first purchase. That's thrive, C-A-U-S-E medics.com slash infertile AF for 15% off. Thanks so much, Thrive. So how did things change at the, this next clinic? Like what was aside from what you just said, but we're, yeah. what was going on treatment wise? That's when we really got going. Right? We started with the actual IVF, with the medications, with the injections. And it's, uh, I remember going into it too, a friend told me, cause once I started writing about it and being open about it, then that's when you get the calls and the texts and the DMS of like, Oh my gosh, me too. Or I went through this and mm-hmm. here's what helped me or other people just being like, Oh wow. I had like no idea. And we've also been trying for this amount of time. Like maybe we should also look into a consultation. And so mm-hmm. I found, and I'm sure you've seen it too with the podcast, when you start the conversation, other people jump in. <laughs> yeah. Um, And that's the reason like why I even, um, I remember for the self story in particular, I am so used to writing about myself and my freelancing and my blogging that that has not ever been like, I've always been an open book, but this, because it involves me and my husband, like in our future family, I wanted to make sure that he was okay with me sharing this. Mm -hmm. And essentially it was like, you kind of have to not in like you're obligated, but like you have this voice and the gift and a platform and people right. are listening, like it can help someone else. Cause I very much believe in that. I think it was Toni Morrison that said to write the book that you want to read. Like if it doesn't yes. exist, then you have to write it. So similarly, yes. I wasn't seeing young black women in particular talking about IVF and infertility. Um, mm-hmm. It was all either much older, like I said before, centered around white women. And I was just mm-hmm. like, hello, <laughs> anybody yeah. out there? Right. Um, and there are, of course, but again, our like culture and everything else, sometimes there's some, this, the silo of shame around it. And that's why I really applaud like Chrissy Teigen, especially, you know, Michelle mm-hmm. Obama wrote about it in her book, but yep. it kind of gives us all now this permission, like, Hey, it is normal. Like, people are doing this. Yeah. And so, so when I to... talked about, sorry, go ahead. No, <laughs> I was going to say, it's so great um, that so many people are coming out and talking about it. It yeah. is. Yeah. Cause you don't have to suffer alone and it kind of, it normalizes it. I feel like for mainstream, because we know, like you see the hashtags, I'm sure like there's kind of this underground community, right. right. That is uh, talking openly about it, but the more it can, uh, the more mainstream it is, then I feel like the more widely accepted it will be. And so I was telling a friend that like, okay, we're, we're going to start IVF. And she was like, just know that this is a full-time job on top of a full-time job. Right. And I didn't quite get it (laughs) when she said it, but when the boxes and literally there were multiple boxes that arrived with medication, I was like, whoa, I need like a spreadsheet or something to keep track of this. And I delegated to my husband. I was like, listen, I can't like, we both have full-time jobs, right? But I was like, I can't be the one doing my day job, also tracking everything with IVF and the Medicaid, like that's just, that's going to have to be you. Like you're in charge and tell me when it's time for this shot. And I'll be like, okay, but I, I can't manage both of this. So having him as a partner in this mm-hmm. as well and being very active has certainly helped. And we yeah. went through our first cycle was in February. Okay. Of March. this year. Of this year. Okay. Yeah. Right of before. This, of this five year long year. 
my I gosh. Love, I love that you describe it, it that way. Cause it's, you're so right. It's like, oh my God, is it still 2020? What the hell? It is still 2020. <gasps> yeah. And at the beginning of, yeah, February is when we started the injections we're preparing for a March transfer. And I actually remember vividly the day that I started working from home even before the lockdown because I was so uncomfortable from the medications. Like I was bloated, hella bloated, like pants didn't fit. Riding the yeah. bus to and from work when it's hitting the potholes was like okay. super uncomfortable. <laughs> I was like, forget this. I'm staying home. Yeah. And literally the next week, everything shut down. So I haven't been back to my office. <laughs> like there's still stuff there that I need to get eventually, but yes. I kind of had a, a head start on the perma work from home. And yeah, yeah it so was. Can I ask you too, what was, yeah. how, how is this affecting your, your husband and your relationship? And you don't have to say anything that's too personal, but I've been very vocal about how, it, you know, it, it almost broke my husband and I, like we were really in a dark place and I know it, yeah. you know, it has that effect on relationships, obviously, because you're fighting about money and sex and procedures all and the things. <laughs> not everybody's on the same page all the time. And you know, yeah. so can you tell me a little bit about that? It's real. It's real. I think the blessing in disguise for us is that we had also, so there were a lot of things starting for us at the beginning of 2020, IVF, also couples therapy. Mm -hmm. And so we had a built in outlet to talk about what was going on every other Friday. Um, oh. We sit down, actually it's, it's today is Friday and we have that <laughs> this afternoon as well, but it's been oh, nice. Good. Yeah. I, like I, and I had been in individual therapy for a couple of years leading up to it, but I think recognizing that this has the potential to take a toll, to stress us out, especially even like last year when we were still trying naturally. And I was like a a dictator over here with the glow app being like, ovulation starts in two days. We have yeah. to be ready. Like all systems go. <laughs> like, right, totally. Really running a tight ship over here. Yes. Like, takes, uh, it's real sexy the, too, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. And like the romance out of it. And now it's essentially like a, a glorified science experiment essentially that mm -hmm. we're doing. And so I think that has been having therapy at the same time of doing IVF has helped tremendously because there is a built-in outlet to discuss what's going on and how we're feeling where those conversations may not naturally come up, just the two of us. And most mm -hmm. recently, so a couple other spoilers, the first cycle didn't take, mm -hmm. the second one got canceled before we even made it to the transfer. Mm -hmm. And as of two weeks ago, our third cycle also failed, like that transfer. Oh, so sorry. Um, Thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. It's been, it was like a whirlwind, um, yeah. all of that. And when the second one got canceled, we had already taken off like the day of the transfer and decided to keep that day off and just kind of unplug. And we went apple picking because it was mm -hmm. like late September. And that day my husband shared on his Instagram and Facebook very vulnerably about what this has been like for him because mm -hmm. Like you, you read the self piece, you know, the interviews and everything else that mm -hmm. I've done. So I've been very vocal about it throughout the whole process. And this was the first time he essentially opened up from where he was sitting. And I was so proud of him because I feel like for as few resources that exist for black women, there's even fewer, if any, honestly, for black men. Yeah, and it's so true. The vulnerability there, even of just being a black man talking about your emotions and mm -hmm. this not being where we saw ourselves and wishing for this thing that hasn't happened, feeling a little bit like kind of separated from because everything is happening physically to me. Like I am going to the appointment, I am getting the blood work done, I am doing the injections and he's helping. There's only so much as the partner who is not the one that's going to be carrying mm -hmm. the child that, um, that he can do. And he talked openly about that and the outpouring of support from family and friends and other Black men, honestly, because like I said before, I don't know of too many who have talked mm -hmm. um, openly from their side, uh, their point of view of what the experience is like. So that has been. That's great. Really. Yeah. I was like, I'm so proud of you. Yeah, <laughs> like, totally. That's but, amazing. Yeah. yeah. So did he feel like re a little bit relieved after that? And like. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like a. I mean, it is a burden, but like also kind of a weight relieved and just yeah. sharing this and even the stat news article or, um, yeah, interview and photo shoot that we did with, um, the reporter at asked, it's one thing, you know, the like 
oh, can we interview you for this story? And I'm like, yeah, of course. Then when she followed up with like, and we were wondering if you would be open to a photo shoot and kind of like the face of the story. And I was like, well, that's not, I didn't like <laughs> sign didn't up sign to be up the poster girl. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. My, and in my journalism background, I know how important it is to humanize the story in right. that way. And especially when we're talking about Black women and infertility and the Google search, kind of so much like a yoga teacher, you look it up and it's like, okay, again, thin white women. I yes. was like, this is important. Yes. to show our face. And I told her, I was like, I'll do it, but with the condition that my husband can join in too, because this is not just my story, it's our story. Okay. And he's very much an introvert, but he agreed to it, which yeah. I was very thankful for. But That's... yeah, it, and it's showing that it's, it's infertility is a team sport. <laughs> it is. <laughs> a team many, sport many nobody wanted to join, but <laughs> all of a sudden. Yeah, exactly. It's, we, we always call it the worst club with the best members because it's like no one wanted to join this club, but everybody who's in it is amazing. So tell me a little bit more about what's going on now, if you don't mind. Like, are, so, yeah. I'm so sorry to hear about the last cycle. Are you, how are you feeling? Right now, like, okay with it. And it's with the first one that failed and this most recent one, I, again, back to like, you know, your body best and never felt pregnant, if that makes sense. Like Mm -hmm. after we shared our story, we do have another friend, a couple that went through IVF, got pregnant on the first cycle with twins. And it was just like the success story. And I Mm -hmm. think that's what we envisioned for us, minus the twins. I was like one embryo at a time. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, yeah. Like I, I, we, we can't, that's, yeah. that's a lot. And so I just assumed that it would be the same for us. Like I'm sure. relatively healthy. Otherwise that's the thing. I don't know if I explicitly connected the dots before, but essentially they believe that the tubes are blocked because of scar tissue from the fibroid surgery. Essentially. Okay. Okay. So it's all connected, yes, <laughs> um, which yes. is frustrating because I'm like, well, maybe we should have started earlier. But it was like, girl, you weren't emotionally, financially, exactly. like just not, not ready. So right, um, there's never really a perfect time, right? And then yeah. you can always, you could drive yourself crazy second guessing. Well, maybe we should have done this, or maybe we should have done this, and it's just like, there's kind of no point, mm-hmm. right? At the end of the mm-hmm. day, it's like you can't change it. No, you, I feel like make the best decision you can mm-hmm. at the time with the information that you have. And that's really all you can do. So I remember after the first cycle, I was like, cause my girlfriend was like, oh, you'll know, you'll be able to tell. Like, and I didn't feel anything. So I kind of knew mm. and essentially was waiting for the call is like confirmation when they do the blood mm-hmm. pregnancy test. And so yeah. did you do any early, early testing? No, no, I never did either. Yeah. I was like, I have a feeling this isn't going to, which I feel bad for my husband then because I have this feeling all week. Like, I think there's a lot of optimism in that first week, but then when you get to the second one and you're like, oh, I don't feel any different mm-hmm. <laughs> that starts to wane. And so I'm carrying around what feels like this secret almost of like, it didn't work, but waiting for the confirmation while he's just like, well, we did everything right. So it's got to work. Like right. not feeling literally like what I'm feeling or the lack thereof, I guess. So it's, it's disappointing. This most recent one, we were in the middle of uh, a staycation because my birthday is three days before our anniversary. So we usually like combine it all in one. Mm-hmm. So my birthday was on Thursday and Fridays when we had the test mm-hmm. and those hours in between waiting. The thing I did this time though, I was like, I need you to also take off. The friend who told me about IVF being a full-time job also recommended taking the day off of the pregnancy test because she was like, either way, you're not going to be focused <laughs> on right. work. Like, That's great advice. Yeah. No matter the outcome. So I did that the first time, but Jeff didn't. And I was left to kind of like in this sadness on my own. So I was like, no, 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 this time around, I need you to also be off. Mm-hmm. And I told him this time, I was like, I need you to take the call. Cause mm-hmm. I, I still, I had that feeling again, that this, it wasn't successful. And I, wasn't able to, I knew I wasn't going to be able to like, listen to it. Like the, that confirmation of like, you have to take the call. And the day before I was telling another friend and she said, a friend of hers, like have a bottle of wine on deck. Yeah. And so we did <laughs> the day Good. before I had gone to target and bought the wine. Yep. Um, so it was already there and mm-hmm. um, it was disappointing and it's frustrating, especially when you're like, 
we, we followed the rules. We did all the things I didn't work out in those two weeks. I missed out on my Peloton birthday shout out because of this, like <laughs> not that important in the grand. No, thing, I know what you just, mean. I totally yeah. know what you mean. <laughs> that, I think it's, that's uh, the whole thing is like, I've equated it to, it's like studying for a test, like crazy pulling all nighters. Yeah. And then you get an F and you're like, what in the world? Like, well, how is this possible? It doesn't make sense. It's not fair. Like it doesn't add up. It's very, very, especially for me, like I am a perfectionist. I am type A to a T. And so I know intellectually IVF isn't the silver bullet and it's not guaranteed to work, but I also am like, but, but why not? And I think the thing that's been really frustrating for me, not really frustrating, but like is is a thing and being vocal and open about our journey and sharing have had people, like I said before, coming to me uh, either confiding or for advice or just like words of encouragement, and which I feel really honored to do like that position. Mm-hmm. I am grateful to be able to do that for people. But then when I see them <laughs> announcing their pregnancies and I'm like, what the hell? Like, right. <laughs> which, I was like, okay, yeah. cool. So I can encourage others and help them, but like, it's hard to right. see so other I people. I had a, a little hand in that, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I know. okay, cool. I know it is. Yeah. You're, it is hard. you're out here with the blessing and um, just like, okay. And so then that jealousy comes back in again. And I think especially for me, um, cause again, going back to being a faith and just like, God, what am I missing? Like, what is the lesson here? What did I not get the first two times that this is happening? Right. Again, like, it's very hard to like keep that faith and that trust and wait when everyone around you, around you seems to be just like, especially when it's like, oh, you haven't been married as long, which obviously doesn't matter. But like (laughs) me, I'm like, but we've been at this longer or like, yeah, they tried for five months and then got pregnant. And I'm like, we've been at this longer. I know. Um, It's like that thing though, like comparison is the thief of joy, right? It's like, you just so hard not to compare, but it almost like makes it worse when you're like looking at, like you said. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about fertility for colored girls. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I know you've, you've described that as like a safe spot for you to land. Tell me what that has brought to your journey and how it's helped you. It's, um, and it's funny because I've only been to the retreat. Like I went to the retreat, but I follow them online, like in Mm -hmm. the um, community virtually, but even being in that space and hearing other women share their stories gave me hope one, because there were a lot of success stories within that as well, but there are also women who are still in the middle of it. And I think that's something that with everything that I've shared, like it's so easy. Uh, I shouldn't say easy, but it's one thing once you're on the other side of it to share like the happily ever after and like, mm-hmm. Oh, it worked out for me. It's another thing. And I guess what I wasn't seeing was that sort of messy middle mm-hmm. that I'm in right now where it's like, I don't know how this story is going to turn out and yep. what the ending is going to be, but I'm going to share anyway. Yeah. And be in a community with other women who were also in that messy middle it was very helpful. And um, another group, uh, Broken Brown Egg. Oh my God, I Regina! To... <laughs> I just she, <laughs> oh I just gosh. interviewed her. Saw uh, that. I oh, love yes. her so much. She I love her. like that was such a breath air because I feel like we're you know Reverend Dunn with fertility for colored girls. I'm missing a bit older, very much faith based, and it's like spiritual and it's great. Broken Brown Egg and Regina was like, yo, so this is how it really is. Right? <laughs> like, was more of that like down to earth. And so, um, I went to, yeah. was it this year? Yeah. Her mother's day happy hour. Okay. Um, because me being a planner, I was like, okay, if I go to the mother's day happy hour and I am sad during this um, occasion, cause we like, I, at the top of the year was like, IVF is going to work my mother's day. Um, you know, I'll be pregnant and celebrating. Mm-hmm. And that was not the case. So I knew I was anticipating sadness and thought that I could plan for it. And like Morgan Freeman narrated my life is like, she would soon learn that you could not plan <laughs> for grief. <laughs> and, um, Oh my God. Yeah. That's so good. <laughs> but I tried. I tried. And the happy hour was great because we were just talking and drinking and it yes. was a, a good time. Have um, you met her in person? Because you guys are both no, Chicago. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. Uh, man, this pandemic just like I know. came in and rocked everything. But yeah. one day I do hope to meet her For sure. in person. There was a post that she had on Instagram, I think, and it summarized 
it put to words what I was feeling, but didn't have the words for about people out here having free babies. And I was like, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, that's exactly it. Like not paying for treatments, not tests, not (laughs) co-pays every other day, getting blood work and ultrasounds and monitoring appointments and injections and all the things, but just free babies. And I was like, that's That's it. So good. That's it. That's yep. exactly. So <laughs> that community, that honest, that realness where it's like, you're saying the thing that people are thinking, but maybe don't feel empowered to say or comfortable in saying, um, and that she says is just like, it feels like a hug. <laughs> yeah. I love her too. Cause she's always like, I didn't kill anybody today. So it was a good day. <laughs> she's like, I'm Let's, not getting yes. arrested. I'm not in jail. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's so Small real. Ends. I love it. Yeah. And that has been everything to me. And that's what I share with other friends going through it. Because I think in them sharing their journeys empowers me to do the same, gives me confidence in doing that. And then I can be that for others and share resources with others and just letting people know that they're not alone, especially for Black women. Because like I said, again, it can be very isolating, Mm -hmm. intensified by the fact that you could be the only one in your clinic, um, in your family, among your friend group, even who is right. going through this. And so having that community that has your back, that knows what you're going through is, I wouldn't be, yeah, it's everything. <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's hard to put words to, cause it's no, like, I, know. I don't it know where it would be without too, right? it. It does. Yeah. yeah. I feel that. I feel like every time I talk to Regina, I feel like I want to cry. Cause I'm just like, you get it. Like she's, she has that gift of like really connecting and, and articulating mm-hmm. too. And you do as well. So oh, thank um, you. what it, what's next for you, do you think? And not to put pressure on. I mean, I don't know. Oh, yeah. No, there is to... a plan. Like I said, I'm okay. a planner. Yeah. So, <laughs> we had had, uh, it was last week, actually, the consultation with um, Dr. Jelani and she's recommending we do uh, two things. Another HSG test, which I am not thrilled about because mm. I it hurt like hell. And I think that actually is going to be next week and also another egg retrieval and testing and genetic testing for those embryos and the ones that we have currently, mm-hmm. which again, I'm like dollar signs, dollar signs. And so how many ever- want to go? <laughs> yeah, uh, we have four left. Okay. Gotcha. Right now. And um, I think with the testing that can dwindle it down to maybe like two or one and sure. we ideally going to have two kids. So um, she's like, listen, you're probably going to have to do another retrieval at some point. Let's knock it all out at once. So that is a bit disheartening because I was like, well, we didn't plan like in the perfect world, you do one round, you have multiple embryos, it works. And then you have like the other one kind of like hanging out, waiting for its turn. Um, And that we have to go through the retrieval again, all those hormones, all those injections. And um, yeah, not looking forward to that part, but I'm optimistic that we are getting closer. Okay, guys, thanks so much for listening to my conversation with L'Oreal and L'Oreal. Thank you so much for sharing what you've gone through so far with us. We are all rooting for you as you continue your journey and you will keep us posted. So guys, make sure to follow her at LT in the city on Instagram and also make sure to follow me at infertile AF stories for updates and behind the scenes stuff. Another thing is that Fertility Rally is obviously the place that I wish I had had when I was going through my journey. So if you're navigating infertility or you're going through surrogacy or adoption or no matter what you're going through, we have created the safe space for you. It's a community. There's content. You can find out more on our Instagram at Fertility Rally. Our memberships are open the first week of every month. We would love to have you. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me or at Fertility Rally. All right. Talk to you guys next time.